Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Digitech's first webinar of the year, Open Education at Texas Community Colleges, a showcase of research and practices. I just want to take this time to thank Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER for hosting this webinar. Within the last year, Digitex has provided funds to sponsor membership to the CCC OER for up to 19 Texas colleges. I also want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Judith Sebesta on behalf of Digitex and our Texas College partners for her involvement in co-hosting this webinar with the CCC OER. Judith has been a long-standing advocate of OER growth and development across the state. Also, I believe I speak on behalf of everyone here today um, in that we are immensely excited to hear about the wonderful work being done at Colin Laredo and San Jacinto Colleges. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn from your experiences on how to sustain successful OER initiatives at our respective institutions. Uh, joining us today from these colleges to share their stories are Dr. Elizabeth Rodriguez, the Dean of Academic Innovation and Technology from Laredo College, Dr. Nikki Whiteside, the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Inst Institutional Innovation and Support at San Jacinto College, and Regina Hughes, Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. Um, again, just as a reminder, we're going to be recording this webinar and we will be making it available through our Digitex YouTube channel. And lastly, we will be sharing the presentation slide deck via email after our webinar. Una and Judith, I'll let you take the lead from here. Thank you, Denise. And I'm... There we go. All right. Let me just start the slides going. All right, well, I am super excited to be here uh, to join you in Texas this afternoon um, and to celebrate the great work that's happening in Texas under the leadership of Digitex um, and um, more broadly, um, all of the wonderful Texas OER landscape work that has been done over the years uh, through Digitex. And then the amazing colleges that we've had the opportunity to work with um, uh, over the last decade, actually. Um, so San Jacinto has been a longtime member of um, CCCOER, not, not an entire decade, but some of the colleges in Texas actually for over a decade, like Houston Community College. So just wonderful to, to spend some time with you today and uh, celebrate your work. Um, and so um, I am, uh, Denise has introduced me, of course, um, but I want to give um, everybody else a chance to just say hello. Um, and and uh, once again, I'm Una Daly, and I'll pass it over to Judith, who, and then um, our actual presenters. Oh, thank you so much, Una. And yes, I am Judith Sebesta, and I am honored to serve as the president of the Executive Council for CCC OER. Regina, let me turn it over to you. I'm Regina Hughes, and I'm thrilled to be here, and I look forward to sharing our story with you all. So um, <clears throat> it was, I was talking earlier to, to Denise and Elizabeth um, and Una, I believe, or Judith, uh, and asked to prepare in response to the questions. Um, I was actually a little bit surprised about the work we have done. Honestly, I've never really looked at our work here at Collin College um, in the way that this um, webinar has allowed me to look. And so I'm, I'm pleased to share our story. So to give you a little bit of a background about who we are, we're located in the North Texas area. So we're Plano, McKinney, um, Frisco. And so just think of North Texas and we're in that area. About 56,000 plus students annually, 11 campuses, and about 100 plus programs of study, three bachelor's degree, working on our fourth bachelor's degree. Um, so what motivated us to adopt OER? Like many of you, um, we've been hearing about the high cost of textbooks for a long time. And um, so I would say that for us, OER has, uh, was born from the perfect storm. So not only did we hear from student groups at least 15 years ago, that actually presented in front of our board of trustees saying, what are you guys doing about the high cost of textbooks? So there's that, right, that energy. Then we had some very vocal board members who were saying, okay, what are you guys doing about the high cost of textbooks? And I was teaching at the time. And then I knew myself in looking that, you know, these textbook prices are going up. So what are we going to do? 
So probably in early 2012, I started looking at alter alternatives. Um, I had taught psychology full time. And one of the things I first noticed is there was, it was difficult to find something, right? And then I heard about, oh, this little organization called OpenStax, who was basically just getting off the ground. Um, <clears throat> at the time, they didn't have anything in psychology, and I landed on something called NOBA. I was thrilled about this OER. I, I started talking to my colleagues about it. And then right about 2018, I, I landed the job that I have now as associate dean, so I never did get to integrate it. Um, so. I continued and, in my role sharing all of these things about OER with my faculty and in, in my psychology uh, colleagues. And then in 2018, we responded as an institution and created a no cost, low cost exploratory committee. And we had two phases. And because I was very interested and had been vocal, I was invited to be part of that. And then later on, after phase one, which was really the exploratory phase, I was asked to lead phase two, which was now taking recommendations from phase one and really integrating them. And so I began uh, doing research initially, calling peer institutions. Um, I'm gonna call out Carrie Gitz because she's here, but we utilized Austin Community College and it was amazing to see what they had done. So I, you know, advocate of why reinvent the wheel. I actually attended some webinars by Digitex, the uh, Higher Education Coordinating Board, in 2020, um, and this was all about the grants that were becoming available. So thanks to the legislation in Texas, which accelerated also a lot of the work in OER, um, I, was, I, I felt like it was just the perfect timing for all of this to unfold. And so for us, again, in 2019, there was an independent study commissioned by um, Digitex uh, that I utilized and it became really kind of a handbook. One of the first things that I found in that is uh, the importance of faculty development stipends. And so I kind of took that on. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and just start with, OK, let's talk about some of our successes and challenges. I'm going to start with our challenges. Um, if you think about the timing, what happened? Well, darn it, a pandemic. And so in 2020, a lot of our efforts were put on hold as an institution. And yet we still did the research. And so that's kind of where I focused. Um, so some of the primary challenges beyond the pandemic, awareness and education, like what is OER? A lot of people did not know. And I, I had to work really hard to dispel some of the myths about it. And again, we've come a long way uh, in, in what is uh, OER, the quality. Interestingly, at the same time we were in our exploratory committee and really starting to kind of ramp that up, we were at the institution lost, uh, launching first day access. And I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> this is counterintuitive. It felt, it felt like it. But I think, to, in, in all fairness, it was in response to the overall um, charge of reducing textbook costs. So that has actually been very successful for us. Um, another challenge is understanding what the Senate Bill 810 required and what the implications were of the legislation, particularly the searchable database. We were kind of behind the eight ball on that. And then we, we talked to some peer institutions of how do you tag those courses? And I will be honest with you, we're still working on that, fine tuning it. We're getting ready to transition. We're in process of going to Workday, which, you know, trying to understand the implications of Workday and how that's going to unfold for us is, is, still ongoing, uh, creating a common language across the institution about what OER is, what first day access is, that becomes really critical. Again, finding funding for faculty, maintaining our momentum, creating a sustainable infrastructure, uh, including a website landing page, the data gathering, um, and then student awareness, because internally we use all these acronyms, right? But our students don't know what OER is. Even if they do a search on it, they may not know what it is. So we're working on that right now. Um, so some of our successes. Well, having uh, a strategy for who you place or invite, uh, well, sometimes it's place, right? The voluntold placement on the membership. So we have an OER steering committee that we continue to expand. It includes our librarians. We have academic leadership, including our provost, one of our provosts. 
we have, uh, luckily I knew our grants director very well and had many conversations with her early on. And the beauty of that is that she is so sold on OER that when grant opportunities come in, she is calling me and saying, hey, Regina, here's a grant. And, you know, having her at that point and be my eyes, that has been critical for us. Um, instructional designers, uh, faculty, of course, and then internal IT folks. Other successes. We don't have a full-on zero or Z degree, but because the banking, I have workforce programs, the banking program here came into my leadership two years ago. I talked a lot about OER with my faculty members. And so I can success, I, I'm very happy to say that nine of the courses in the banking program outside of the core classes all have been converted as of this semester, I believe fully to OER, which is if you were to add up the cost for apparently banking classes are very expensive. The books, um, that's a $1,700 savings for our students just in that one group of classes, nine classes. Um, we have added what we refer to as an attribute and we use banner in our learning management system. So students can look for that attribute and they're able to search to see which courses are OER. Um, we are about, I'm going to say over 100 faculty and over 25 dip disciplines using OER. Uh, we have the, as I said, librarians were, are on our steering committee and they have taken on a whole life of their own. Whenever I hear stuff about libraries, I've gotten some stuff from Spark, et cetera, and I have sent it on to them and said, hey, how about you take these classes, you know? Um, so they have created a LibGuide, which is sort of our landing page, um, and we're still working on that. They they actually offered on their own, created a whole series, a cafe series on OER this semester. And I, I again, that's the beauty of it. We aren't centralized. We're, I want to call this committee is decentralized. And this is, you know, my other, other job, if you will, because those of you that are the, the core people in OER know how much work this can take. And so having other people who kind of take it on on their, their own is incredible. Um, we've been able to attain about, I'm gonna say at this point, $100,000 worth of faculty stipend grants, which has been pretty monumental. Um, State Farm is a partner of ours and they are sold on OER. And so each year they're, they're giving us a little bit of money and I used uh, Carrie Gitt's work. Um, Austin Community College and Tarleton State helped us create our very first State Farm Awareness grants and, and evaluation grants. And we looked at their materials and kind of tiered it. We required our faculty to do the Texas Learn OER course that Carrie created. Um, so all of these things have been incredibly helpful for us. Um, we had some CARES grant funding as well. And then the the, uh, the other question that we were asked to address really and touch on, and again, I, I can't drive this point uh, home any more than I'm going to, but the community of practice through Digitech CCC OER has been unbelievably critical for us because it's been a game changer knowing other practitioners out there and, and calling on them and, and they're so generous with their information. It's not proprietary, it's here. Take what we have and use it. Um, that's been incredibly helpful for us. We did become um, an, an OER um, OpenStax institutional partner this year. So that has been very helpful for us. Um, we launched uh, iCallIn Campus in 2021, a fully online campus and our provost, Dr. Sarah Lee joined as a member of Digitex on our behalf, so that's wonderful. And then this year is the first time we uh, are a member of CCC OER. And I will tell you that as a community of practice, having access to that Google group, oh my gosh, now I'm getting people sending me stuff saying, hey, Regina, did you see this? And then I can send it on to another group of people. So it has just sort of radiated out and become a really important piece of, I'm going to call it a continued sustainability of our of our program. Um, and as I said, the grants director, her being in that place where we can kind of put all these pieces together, I think really um, these are the things that have defined our program. Um, again, it's it's been 
um, it's been quite a journey. We're not anywhere near where I want to be, um, but I would say that having the quality of OERs, particularly through OpenStax, um, and being able to share that with our faculty and say, no, 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 it's not what you think it is, right? It, it's really good stuff. So I'm looking for the snowball effect um, to even become more pronounced. And actually what I'd like to be able to say ultimately is I am not the point person. I just want it to be so infused into our college that you don't need a point person. It just becomes a practice that we all do. Thank you. Wow, thank you, uh, Regina. That's pretty amazing story. And and what what was the date when you started? Um, Officially, that uh, exploratory committee was about 2019 when we. So it was right, you know, right in the middle of then then the pandemic hit. So, wow, <laughs> what amazing accomplishments! Thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, and thrilled to have you part of CCCOER. Um, so um, I think, uh, um, Judith, uh, with your permission, shall we move on to um, Dr. Elizabeth Rodriguez? Um, so thank you very much, Regina. And uh, Dr. Elizabeth Rodriguez, would you like to share your screen or would you like to um, also speak um, extemporaneously? Yeah, I'm just going to speak. I didn't prepare a, a, a presentation. I just thought we would have a conversation. And so our journey at Laredo College isn't as extensive as Regina's. Um, I was jotting down notes as she was talking because we are new I can say new, but as I started the work at our institution for OER, I started to find out what uh, what some of our departments were already doing. But um, so when I became the Dean of Academic Innovation and Technology, one of the things that happened right at the beginning, which was a little over a year ago now, is that Digitext offered a free membership to CCOER, um, CCCOER. And so I jumped right at the opportunity because um, I had heard a lot about OER and I wanted to learn even more before actually bringing it um, to my administration and to our faculty. And so by being part of this organization, it has opened a lot of different opportunities for Laredo College in, in being able to, to participate in different things. So one of the first things that I did when we became members of CCOER, we also got the opportunity to um, do a, it was kind of like a leadership program with Arlo. And so I, at that point I said, you know what, I need a committee. And I reached out to our folks who are, are who are part of our Center of Teaching Excellence and Learning. I reached out to our librarians and I reached out to our um, instructional design team to see who wanted to be part of, of that. Well, I kind of didn't ask. I just kind of told them they were going to be part of the, of the, of the committee. And through that process, again, we were also able to learn a lot about OER. One of our lead faculty members at, um, at, when we did that program, he was completely against OER and he is also our faculty senate president. And so I needed to find a way to have him jump on board because if I wanted to move this anywhere at, at our institution, I needed that support. And so once he was able to go through that program, he also got to travel to, I think it was Boston at the time, to the to the conference for Arlo. Um, and he came back with a different mindset. And so I, I think part of the work that I've been doing is getting our faculty, getting some of our faculty and our librarians and our um, instructional design team ready, right? Ready for when, you know, when we're able to completely become an OER institution. And so while we were doing that work, um, we, Laredo College had implemented the all-inclusive program a few years ago. Um, when that happened, I was not part of those conversations. And about, I want to say about a semester or about a semester ago, they gave it to my office to kind of take over. And as I took over that all-inclusive program, I was, I started seeing a lot of problems with it. Um, I know that it is the cost savings to students, but I also, and one of the things that I learned through Arlo, and I think it was Karen who said it, and, and I jotted that down because 
um, she said that the all inclusive was like a smoke screen, right? Because publishers know that OER is gaining momentum, and at some point, you know, we're, all, all the institutions are going to become, you know, OER institutions, and where where are they going to be left in the process, right? And so the all inclusive program was kind of their way to say, hey, you know, we're we're giving students a, a, a discount. But I started seeing a lot of different problems and I won't get into all of them, but um, one of the conversations I had with my provost is like, if, if you weigh the, if you weigh how much students say to all of the problems that OE, that All Inclusive um, has, you know, that, that, that outweighs what the student savings is, right? Because do they really have access on day one? Um, is the process you know, streamlined through the publishers and our LMS and our faculty. And so there was a lot of problems and um, our administration just made the, the decision to do away with the all-inclusive program at Laredo College starting fall 2023. And so then that that leaves me with, okay, well, we're, we're, what are we going to do now, right? <laughs> um, so that's when I started, you know what, this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to really allow OER to gain momentum at Laredo College. You know, we've got our committee in place. Um, I've worked on, you know, our faculty um, guidelines to help faculty understand, because that's part of the problem, too, that faculty don't really understand. Is it, you know, content that has been vetted? Has it, has it been peer-reviewed? Um, and so they have a lot of questions. And so I think this is the opportunity for Laredo College to really embrace OER and, mm -hmm. and move towards that movement. Um, but as we're doing all this work, I come to find out that our English department um, four years ago decided to be an OER department. And so um, as of this coming summer, they're, all of the courses offered in our English department are open educational resources courses. Um, our bachelor's in organizational leadership is also an OER um, program. And so even though we still have a lot of work to do, we've already started doing some of that work. We have resources on campus that we can you know, turn to. The other thing that we've done is that we applied for a grant. Um, like Regina was talking about, there's money out there for OER. Um, to redevelop some of our courses to give, um, you know, uh, uh, faculty stipends and, and that sort of thing. It's a small grant, so it's kind of like to help us to get started into, into the next steps. But I am going to look, I think we we still do have money from the CARES Act. And, you know, Regina said that some of the, some of the you know, stipends for faculty um, came from that. So I'm going to look into that. So again, our journey at Laredo College, we're still in the infancy, if you, if you will, of, of where of where I would like to see OER, but I think you know the message that I've given to our administration is that you know serving with LTAC, you know with 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 um, committees that drive what the state is doing. I know that OER at some point is is not going to be highly recommended, right? I, I think at some point we need to get ready to really. Um, because I feel that some at some point it's going to come down from the state for us to 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 take OER a little bit more seriously than we have been, and I want to make sure that Laredo College is ready for that. You know, so we've established our committee, we've established you know some some of our guidelines with faculty. We're moving away from the all inclusive, which is an opportunity to incorporate OER. Um, we are also going into eight weeks into eight week semesters and so a uh, starting fall so we have a lot of changes coming in fall of 2023 so we're not only going to uh, move away from the all-inclusive program but we're also going to um, start our eight week um, semesters and so uh, again my message to our administration is this is an opportunity um, where we can gain momentum with OER and and help transition our institution to that right so again our journey is just beginning um, I'm excited about what we've done so far, um, but we do still have a lot of work to 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 do. So thank you. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Elizabeth Rodriguez. That, uh, amazing story, though, um, of of the work you've done and and how you turned around your faculty senate president, who I know, of course, has a lot of influence on campus. Um, right. right. And. There's a lot of colleges who are in that beginning stage and have been in that beginning stage. So do definitely 
um, rely on CCCOER. Um, we've got the email list, but um, I'm always happy, uh, Judith as well, to uh, do some consulting on the phone. You know, if you if you need to have a, you've got some challenges coming up, please do um, get on our calendars. We're happy to. to oh, I'd appreciate that. And and and. It is amazing the support that we get because when we decided, or when administration decided that we were going to move away from the all inclusive starting in the fall, um, I started getting a lot of department chairs wanting to meet with me to see, okay, well, what what is it that you want us, or what what should we do? How do we transition, or you know, how do we move away from all inclusive, or what's the next step? And automatically, I sent an email um, to Karen and asked her, I, I need some resources in a particular, because I had a specific department that was reaching out to me. And I said, I need resources for this particular discipline. And in the morning, I had already multiple emails from different folks who have been, you know, who had already created um, OER um, content in, a, in that specific um, um, discipline. And so it, the support, I think, is, is it it's invaluable, right? And, and so when, when again, when Digitex gave us that opportunity to have a membership, you know, free of charge, that was one of the main reasons I jumped on board because I felt that that I needed people that I can rely on, that I can, that I can ask questions because I'm not the expert. By all means, you know, I'm still learning about OER as well, but I've, but from when I started to where I am now, um, I, I, I think, the support that we've gotten gotten from Digitex, from CCC, um, OER, from Arlo has been invaluable to to where we are today at Laredo College. So thank you so much for that because we we are going to need that support as we continue moving forward. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I just I wanted to emphasize uh, Liz Yada, who's um, our communities manager at CCCOER, just put the link into the community email. So Elizabeth, you might want to invite others on campus um, to use that email list as well. So it's not always you. Um, and of yes. course, just as I think Regina had some wonderful lessons learned that she shared with us about the library and in, in the instructional design and how helpful they can be in this process. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Wow, <laughs> wonderful. Um, and um, now um, Dr. Nikki Whiteside from um, San Jacinto College. Thank you, Una. And thank you everyone else for presenting. I've been making notes of things that I can learn and ideas I have from that. So um, I'm happy to share with you what San Jacinto College has been doing with OER. Uh, we started our OER journey probably uh, around 2015 is when I first became aware uh, people were talking about it and faculty were trying to uh, look at OER and how they could use it in their classes. Um, at the time, and, and still, our current textbook policy says um, departments select one book per course for the for that. So for faculty to just go and adopt OER was a little bit different, difficult, but we had faculty looking at it, wanting to pilot, and a few that did. Um, we were fortunate enough in 2016 to be part of the uh, an Achieving the Dream grant with um, a group of, of several other colleges that we worked with. And we had an English department chair at the time from one of our campuses who took the lead on that. And we had about 20 faculty college-wide that were part of the program. Uh, he came to visit with us. Uh, my area uh, includes a variety of things. I, I like to say my job description is other duties as assigned. But... Um, Two of the areas that relate to OER are instructional design and multimedia development. So uh, he came to talk with us to see how we could work with him and, and we set up to provide that support. So as we were doing the initial development with those 20 or so faculty, um, we worked very closely with Dr. Johnson at the time. I really was focused on helping faculty to create, curate, review content. We had people doing different pieces and then use it in their classroom. So they could uh, be as, as involved, involved as much or as little as they wanted to at the time to, to get to use it. And we brought librarians in to help curate resources to provide that support. One of the things we saw very early on uh, with the first faculty that we're going to teach is this is a different way of teaching with this. It's, it's not the same as taking that book that you're used to having and walking in the class and saying, okay, everybody open to page 23 because digital OER content doesn't always work that exactly that same way. So um, that was one of the things we 
figured out early on, you know, we needed to work with faculty, we needed to help them understand, and we were going to need to help students understand too. So that became a piece as to how we got involved. Um, and it, as it turned out, uh, we offered our first classes in spring of 2017. And then after a year, uh, Dr. Johnson left to take an opportunity at another institution out of state. And our deputy chancellor contacted me and said, have I got a deal for you? Um, and OER became something that became under my purview. This was about the same time as uh, Liz mentioned, we started looking at inclusive access at the college and how we could do that. So we focused and combined everything together into an affordable learning initiative, really to make sure faculty were understanding, here are the different options for students, here are the cost savings for students, here's how we can help our students have the materials and be successful. Um, I looked back at the data for this presentation, and since spring of 2017, when we offered our first OER classes to this semester, we estimate students have saved uh, just over $18 million. Uh, in text over that time. Now we do have uh, four camp. We have multiple campuses. We have four campuses, so uh, you know we, we have a lot of students. But um, we also this semester our research office pulls out now as a daily report the number of enrollments by not just by campuses but by um, the course material. So we have open books uh, OER, which is our completely no cost. Uh, Back, the, they can have any cost. Uh, open books, low cost that are less than $50. Open books plus, which is our first day initiative, and then non-traditional textbooks. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, non-open books, which are traditional textbooks. It's interesting looking at our all of our enrollments this spring, only 36% of those students are using traditional textbooks. 64% are using one of the other options for affordable learning and 23% are using completely no cost books for that. So um, we're, we're always excited to see that happen, to watch that grow and to see that faculty are really uh, catching on to this and, and being part of it. One of the, I apologize, I hit, I hit my mute button. One of the things we did early on is we looked at the course materials guidelines and realized they were not conducive to getting faculty to use OER. Uh, because you had to get all the faculty in one department that taught a specific course to agree, and that wasn't always easy. So we um, worked through uh, across all the campuses. We, we had faculty look at this and with our administration, and we were able to change that to give faculty the choice. They could either use the book that was selected by the department, if it was a, a traditional publisher book or something else, or they could choose to use OER. So this gave faculty an option to deviate from what a, a book that some other group may have selected for them and to choose the materials that works best for them. And that helped us to increase the adoption rate by giving faculty that flexibility uh, to do that. Um, the other thing we have done that I think has helped us to, to be successful, we, we continue to work, uh, make sure our instructional designers are up to speed on OER, our media production, uh, we go to division and department meetings regularly. You know, we're always trying to share information about OER. Um, the emails that come from, from CCC OER, from OpenStack, from different places about new resources are great. And we make sure to pass those along to the people and the disciplines that are specific. We always send them to the libraries because they're always cultivating their uh, libguide that they have for OER. But, um, you know, Reaching, making sure we're reaching out. And then we're also developing repositories. Uh, this is really where our community, the community of practice was so beneficial for us because uh, in 2021, 2022, we were tasked with, uh, as an annual priority approved by the board, to make sure we had repositories in place for our faculty so that we could start pulling these resources together to make it easier for our faculty to access. And fortunately, uh, State of Texas, working with uh, Digitex, the coordinating board, uh, created the OERTX site, uh, which is uh, the repository that we immediately uh, jumped on when we had the opportunity. We said, yes, we want to join. We created a portal, started adding content, 
And then we went a step further to do the integration with uh, OERTX to our learning management system. We actually use Blackboard, but we did the plug-in. So one of the things when we train our faculty on how to look up uh, OER content, how to find it, we show them how to tag it, how to set it up, how to make it available, and how to get to it directly from their courses, which makes it easier if they're not having to go out other places to look for it or to find it and come back. So you know, we've tried to simplify that and streamline that to help them. Uh, also, when we set up our site, uh, if you happen to look on the OERTX site, you, you'll see St. Jacinto College has a hub. And when we set up our hub, we created um, collections based on the learning pathways that we use here at the college. So that way our faculty can very easily go in, they can find things that have been tagged by other users uh, to pull that together. And we created, uh, different groups within, within that. Uh, English was one of the first groups to jump on board and be part of that. Uh, they were working on a um, grant through the Texas, funded by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, not for an English course, but for a humanities course. And uh, the department chair that led that was, a, was an English faculty, uh, and she worked with all of our campuses and our humanities courses are taught by people from different disciplines. It's not just English and we don't have a specific humanities department. But instead of creating um, just text-based resources, they worked with our media department and went in and recorded brief videos. And they have a collection of videos now about different topics that are part of our humanities 1301 course that any faculty can go and use. Uh, they're captioned, everything's set up, you know, accessible. And uh, it allows faculty to go in and use that and share those resources. And maybe an area they're not as comfortable teaching or they want to expand and add, they haven't done it. It gives them that uh, resource. And if it's, a lot of faculty have been excited just thinking, oh, it doesn't have to be text uh, or it doesn't have, I, I don't just have to use one book because the students can't afford one book. I can pull from different places and pull that together. And, and so those are some of the things that we're constantly, you know, trying to work with and get that message out. Um, we had a, quite a bit of success last summer. We created a pilot program that uh, for professional development sessions that we did internally. We had uh, ended up with nine faculty sign up to do it over the summer. We got approval and, and got it out late, but we had nine faculty commit to do this while they were off for the summer. Uh, it was a two week program. They had to commit to 24 hours. The pre-work they did was uh, the Texas Learn OER content that uh, was put together by Digitex. So they had to go through that and show us that certificate to come into the course. So they had a basic understanding. And then they collaborated with an instructional designer or media uh, specialist, depending or both, depending on what they wanted to do for a project. And they took, uh, the requirement was they had to take the content that they created and make it available on the repository in OERTX. And it really helped them get a better understanding of how to do it. it. As you can imagine, in 24 hours, they're not developing a whole course. They might be developing a module or a session or, or to get a start, but it gave them an idea of how to do that. And from that, we've had some really positive feedback come out. We've had a lot of involvement for, um, the faculty, sorry, uh, for the faculty to, um, you know, to come back and ask for interest. We've had faculty from that program that have worked with us since to write grants, uh, to apply for grants to develop additional OER. Uh, we, you know, we've had them share with other faculty who are coming to us look for ideas. So just trying to find different ways to reach the faculty to make sure they're aware has been something that's been very, very positive for us and making sure they know that they have that support available with our designers, with our media, um, and so that we have those champions that, that go forward. Uh, one of the things we don't have that I noticed both Regina and Liz mentioned, um, we don't currently have a steering committee for OER. We've had that in the past um, during COVID, as like many of us, some things just didn't really work well. And that's something that we got out of the practice of doing. And when we came back, uh, we had not put that together, but it is a priority for us. That's something we're looking at reinstituting next year. Even though we have good involvement, we wanna find a way to reach out to faculty uh, to do more and, and to get the word out. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge for us with a number of faculty, both full and part-time, 
how do you get that word out? So uh, we're, we're just trying to take every avenue we can to do that. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And um, thank you, Carrie, for sharing the, uh, the uh, OER hub uh, and uh, the one specifically for San Jacinto. Uh, that's really impressive. Um, and at this point, uh, wow, I just, um, I know Judith and I are just like, ugh, amazing. Um, we, we didn't realize all of the great work that's being done at your individual colleges. And um, Judith, would you like to move into the Q&A at this point? And maybe we'll save five minutes at the end for um, our, our sort of concluding slides. Yes, although did, I, I had prepared um, some information about research about the Texas landscape studies, as well as another resource. But if you'd rather I just go ahead and go into the q and I will. Um, it's, it's up to you, Judith, if you, um, we had some slides as well. Um, I don't know, are there questions pending um, in, the, um, in the chat window? No, but if you want to go ahead with the, with the q and I've got a question I would love to ask our, um, our speakers from the Texas Community Colleges, just incredible information, as Una said. And I, you know, all three of you mentioned data. And I just was wondering if you might be willing to talk just a little bit more about the importance of data to your open educational research, resource programs, um, how you're collecting and gathering these data, what your strategies might be, if any, and, and where you're looking to go in your data collection. I'll jump in. Uh, you know, I mentioned that our research office, we brought them in very early on uh, to collect data um, as part of the Achieving the Dream grant, and we've tried to, to continue uh, with that data. Um, we regularly, uh, actually, if I don't send it by uh, a certain point in the semester, the chancellor reaches out, her office asks, where's the data on the savings? What are we doing for our students? How is this working? So we're regularly updating the estimated savings for our students. Um, we uh, daily are looking at where students have enrolled by different semester that just goes to all of our instructional administrators uh, so that we can see where the growth is. And it's not just uh, the current semester, it's the comparison to like spring 2023 is compared to spring 2022. So we can see where things are growing. And I'm always very excited to see um, non-open books going down and, and our open books is going up because I know that's helping our students. Uh, and then one of the things we're going to be doing with the data over the summer, we're going to be uh, looking at the A to C success data for our students for uh, specifically OER content classes uh, by course material and by um, mo instructional modality. And we're going to identify some department chairs to sit with us and work through and come up with some guidelines of how um, how the departments might look at this data, really evaluate, make sure that the uh, you know they ha they have the best materials, what and and what's working, and, and really kind of kind of dig down into how the materials are working for the students, and and that's something we're going to be piloting over the summer. You know, Nikki, I think I suspect because of San Jacinto being on the vanguard of getting funding through ATD for their open education work, you were probably um, on the vanguard again in terms of data collection, because for better or worse, sometimes we feel you usually have to do that kind of data collection for reporting right. to a funder, be they federal, be they state, right. be they private. So and um, yes, because since we had that data already, we met, I met with a research office very early on when I was given the opportunity to, to head up our open books and said, we're already collecting it. Let's not stop. It, keep running those programs every day and those uh, you know data programs. So we've been able to keep that data and we have it back to about 2017. Oh, wow. That, that's fantastic. And Regina and Elizabeth, if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, oh, I'm go sorry. ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. So uh, mine will be really brief. <laughs> um, so part of our committee, um, our associate VP of institutional research is, is a member of our committee. And although we've not done any um, studies on, for example, our English department who's already gone completely OER, one of the things that we wrote into the grant that we applied for was to show that before and after success points, you know, to see how students um, did after um, OER uh, adoption was, was done through a particular course. So again, we're still in the infancy stages of, of the work that we're doing. 
Um, but definitely because we feel that data speaks volumes, um, it was important to have somebody from our institutional research as part of that committee to help us interpret that data. And so, um, although we don't have a lot to go on yet, and I'm sure if I go back and, you know, because like I said, I am getting a lot of different ideas, especially because our movement has kind of taken, uh, you know, an escalate, like we're, we really have to get something um, going. I think showing um, data or having data to show um, as we move into uh, into more um, conversations about OER is going to be significant. Um, so yeah, we we don't have anything yet, but I know that um, we can gather that data from our English department, and that has been part of our conversations with the committee to be able to have data to show our faculty. I, I wasn't anticipating that we would do away or that we would move away with uh, uh, from our all inclusive so quickly. And so we were still, again, you know, making sure to have everything in place before we got to that point. And fortunately, now I'm, I, I feel like I'm doing a, a catch up game, but um, data is significant. And that's why we included her as part of, of our committee. It sure seems so crucial to have that IR or IE person a part of that committee and baking them into that work. I think that's very insightful, Elizabeth. Regina. Thank you. Yes, you know, I think uh, my answer is going to, uh, I'll try to make it succinct, but it really depends on who the audience is, right? So the board, I, I shared with you early on that our board was, you know, spurned on by students saying, okay, why are, why are the textbooks so high? So there's an accountability, right? And the, the, and the board wants to know, okay, overall, just give us the short and sweet, how much money have you saved our students? That so so gathering that data, you gotta you gotta have all of that together, and that and that's a little bit challenging because, you know, you gotta know who's doing OER. So we make these broad estimates of you know here's what we think based on what the textbook costs have been, and you multiply it by how many you know that kind of a thing, and so you get that broad number. So that appeals to them. For students, they want to know how much are you saving me, right? But but this is where really the rubber meets the road. So we get cost, but it's a but for our faculty. Not that they're not sensitive to it because they are, but it's really about the quality. So it goes to Una's question about the outcomes and what Elizabeth talked about. And is there any difference? And, you know, I haven't, I don't know that any of our faculty internally have compared between OER and non OER, but generally speaking, there's not really any difference from what I'm understanding, right? It doesn't take away um, where we're challenged is to show, okay, you've had the steering committee, what are you guys doing? So, I think the the quality is a really important piece, but it's really not. It's really about the quality of the actual peer reviewed. Have you tried this? You know how good is it, and that becomes something really important. So when you say data, um, it's really about quality of the product itself. And what we're finding for us is when you start talking to faculty, one of the challenges that we face, which this is true for all of OER right now is when you ask faculty, what is it about the particular product they're using, those digital ancillaries become critical because it's a it's a time saver for them. And, um, you know, AI is going to bring a whole new nuance into this conversation as we continue. Um, but uh, generally speaking, that that is what they're looking for is that, OK, we have the text. That's great. But what else do you have for us that's open, that's as high quality as we need it to be? And so I know that's another piece of the data uh, collection that we're looking at right now. Um, well, we're waiting for more questions from our audience, but um, Judith, if you wanted to speak um, to uh, the research that uh, has been done in uh, Texas, that might be really helpful to support the data outcomes. And I can either move the slides for you. Um, yeah, can you just get put it forward to slide 12, if you don't mind? Yes. Excuse me for rushing through these slides. Uh, this uh, I'll come back uh, maybe at the very end and just give you a kind of a little highlight if you weren't at our membership meeting yesterday. And if, is, is that correct, Judith? 
Slide yeah, five. that's great, Una. Thank you so much. And just very quickly, I just wanted to give an overview of these uh, landscape studies that have been done in Texas. As probably many of you are aware, the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas in 2019 began partnering with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education, that was all a mouthful I know, um, to conduct statewide landscape studies on open educational resources with the plan that these would be biennial. And the first one was done in 2019, the second in 2021. And what these studies so far are finding is that Texas is moving towards a very holistic OER ecosystem. And I think we've heard that in the information that was given by our three speakers today at the three community colleges. The large majority of the state's institutions are implementing or are on their way to formal policies or programs to support OER. And the 2020 one report, the 2021 report, excuse me, showed that two-year colleges especially were leading these efforts, leading in the percentage of fully OER-based courses, 93% for two years versus 75% for four-year universities. But even that is a very high number when you compare it to other states across the country. And what the 2021 study found out was that those leading the way in the implementation of OER are taking a systems-based approach by engaging multiple offices and roles across campus, as was again discussed by our speakers today. And I've put a link to the two reports here in the chat, but I wanted to just share one more resource with you, Una, if you don't mind going to the next slide. I had the privilege of working not only on both of those um, studies in previous positions, but also on a resource, resource that was just recently released by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, developed in partnership with the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. And this is the OER in Texas statewide playbook, and it was created to support systems change in opening OER and, and implementing OER across campuses in Texas. And this was developed in consultation with stakeholders at institutions across Texas, including at four community colleges. And this is available through OER Texas, but I'm gonna put a direct link. Oh, Carrie already did. Thank you, Carrie. So you're always on top of it. Appreciate it. Um, so you've got the link to that in the chat, but those are just some resources I wanted to share with you. I do believe that the 2023 uh, landscape study is in the works, but I would have to bow to Denise and Carrie to provide a little bit more information about where there are that where they're at with that if they're able to share it. Thanks, Una. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Carrie or Denise, did you want to share anything about the 2023? Um, sure. So we are we we are working. We 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 did talk with our our stakeholders who, who attended our coordinator meetings. Uh, we are working to develop a timeline. We are going to produce the 2024 uh, Texas Landscape OER uh, report. Carrie, did you want to say something? I see that. No, I'm just turning my camera on to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, and uh, Regina and, uh, and also uh, Dr. Whiteside um, mentioned uh, the Texas Learn OER uh, training that's available through the Digitex website. And Carrie is the author and updater of the information for that training, or she has been in the past, very critical for a uh, very critical resource for our institution. So Carrie, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Denise and, and Carrie. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, well, still open for questions, but um, while we're waiting for some other questions, I might just put out a few things. Um, this is <laughs> a little overwhelming, but I, I did want to mention that um, all of you are members, of course, of CCCOER, um, which is part of Open Education Global. And there's multiple things that OE Global does, which really support open education. And that is the entire, um, you know, mission of open education um, global is a member driven organization to develop and share the impact of open education across the world. So and we're located in, uh, I think, six out of, with members in six out of seven continents. And um, of course, you're one of the regional nodes, uh, the CCCOER, which spans Canada and North America. Um, we also have um, OE uh, LATAM, which is our um, um, Open Education Latin America. Uh, we also have Open Education Week, which just ended um, just a few weeks ago, and I hope many of you were able to participate or, or, or attend some of those wonderful events. And uh, we also have the Open Education Awards, which will open shortly. Uh, the nominations and our Open Education Global Conference. And I'm very quickly going to go through this. 
Uh, well, you know about our members. Uh, we're we're across the uh, North American. And once again, a huge thanks to Digitex for the 19 colleges uh, who are now members um, of CCCOER. So uh, wonderful to have you all on board and don't hesitate to reach out for support. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many opportunities to collaborate. Maybe I'll come back another time and talk a little bit about that. Um, Elizabeth mentioned Arlo. Uh, we also do some work in California um, that's California specific around their ZTZ degrees and um, around one of the open textbook pilot programs. Um, so OE Week, uh, we had contributions from around the world. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm able to see now. Let's see. Whoops, my slide. We had 38 countries contributing in 17 languages. So it's truly a global um, uh, annual event for open education. And it's um, it's we just finished our 11th year um, with more and more participants, over 12,000 participants this year. I really wanted to mention about the um, the conference that's occurring this year in the fall at Norquest Community College in Edmonton, Canada. And we're very excited. This is the first time um, a community college has hosted one of the Open Education Global Conferences. And there'll be people coming in from around the world to share their work. The call for proposal um, is open and it will remain open till May 15th. We'd love to see you there. Um, so do check that out. And uh, Liz, if you get a chance, maybe you can put the link into um, the link for the call for proposal at the conference and you can read all about that. Um, one other thing I would mention about this college is that it focuses not, it's not only focusing on sustainable, uh, creating a sustainable world through open education, that's um, the conference theme, but this is, a, this is a college that resides in the upper part of Alberta, which has a lot of indigenous population, and so they have a, a whole uh, division kind of related to indigenous um, studies, and they're really trying to um, look at open education from an indigenous lens. So it's going to be a very interesting conference. We have a, more monthly webinars coming up. Um, if you're not on our email list, um, definitely join that. Um, Liz put the link in earlier. Um, and um, these are open to all of you members. And we love to hear from folks from Texas. So um, do uh, get in contact with us. Uh, there will be an annual survey coming out shortly. And you can share with us what you want to hear about next year and if you'd like to participate. Thank you for that, Liz. Uh, we have a summer equity book club co coming up. Uh, lots of great information um, about this um, on this slide. I won't repeat it all. But the wonderful thing is we have chosen the OER origin um, uh, book uh, for this summer, which was written by the uh, Amazing Ursula Pike, who is a, who is in the Austin Community College system um, and was formerly at Digitex. And um, I think you'll find this is a, an amazing book um, talking about um, diverse um, people who have um, come to the open education um, movement and their pathways uh, to that. And uh, there's opportunities to just participate. It's every two weeks, live discussions, uh, asynchronous discussions available as well. Or, or you could facilitate one of the chapters if you chose to. Um, and so that's all I had to say. Uh, do we have any other questions, Judith? We do, Una. We have one in the chat from Maribel. Um, she says she's fairly new to OER, but she did a pilot. She did a, a pilot, a course with OER, and she noticed that some material was missing as well as software for statistical students. And she wanted to know if there was any free OER statistics software available for our students. Well, that's, that's a great question, Maribel. And I don't know which OER textbook that you're using. Um, OpenStax, which of course is based right here in Texas at uh, Rice University. They offer, oh, okay. So they offer um, a number of um, books, but the, their introduction to statistics book, um, and they have some homework um, options, some um some online homework systems. They are not free, however, I, but they're very low cost. Um, and is, so you're looking for something that's free, Maribel? There is something available that math faculty use, and I know it's been adapted for statistics. It's called MyOpenMath. <laughs> I'm not a librarian and I'm not a math faculty. 
Uh, but there definitely are some resources out there, Maribel. And um, if you want to contact me, I can connect you with some people who will actually have more details about this. And Maribel, maybe we can also support you by sending your question out through our email listserv. And um, I know that Carrie's here and maybe she can help us maybe conduct a, a search uh, through the uh, Texas repository as well. Um, but I just want to thank everyone for, for your participation today in this wonderful webinar. It was so wonderful that you all took time out of your day to share your stories and experiences. And um, thank you so much uh, to all of our attendees for participating. And we hope you have a wonderful week. And please continue to go back uh, to uh, digit our Digitex website and sign up for more webinars. You all have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.